Show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory. with your neighbors and greet everyone this morning.
Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. Jesus, I'll never forget oh how you set me free. Jesus, I'll never forget how you brought me out. Jesus, I'll never forget how can I forget? Oh, how can I forget what you've done for me? How can I forget oh how you set me free? How can I forget how you brought me out? Jesus, I'll never forget, no, never. How can I forget what you've done for me? How can I forget, oh, how you set me free? How can I forget how you brought me out? Jesus, I'll never forget, no, never. You've done so much, done so much for me. I cannot tell it all, oh, I cannot tell it all, I cannot tell it all. He's done so much to me, I cannot tell it all. He's taken my sins, oh, done so much, oh, he's done so much to me. I cannot tell it all, no, I cannot tell it all, I cannot tell it all. He's done so much for me, Lord, I cannot tell it all. He's taken my sins away. I'll never forget what you've done for me. Jesus, I'll never forget, oh, how you set me free. Jesus, I'll never forget how you brought me out. Jesus, I'll never forget, no, man. You've done so much. You've done so much for me, Lord, I cannot tell it all. I cannot tell it all, no, I cannot tell it all. He's done so much for me, Lord, I cannot tell it all. He's taken my sins away. He's taken my sins away. Oh, he's taken my sins away. Everybody said amen. You may be seated in the house. I'll be in Luke 15 in a few minutes. I'll be in 1 Corinthians 3 right now, but I'll be joining you pretty soon. Um, new converts are amazing. New convert being defined as a new believer in Christ Jesus. Really, they just have some odd mindsets. Um, uh, when I got right with God, uh, I had a friend, of course, my cousin Vernon Lester. Vernon led me to the Lord. But then we had another friend that was big into drugs, and his name was Kevin Lawrence. I mean, Kevin was like, we were into drugs, but not like Kevin. I mean, we were not as bad as he was, but Kevin was something else. So Kevin got right with God, and uh, he too became a preacher. He preaches today. And uh, the thing about Kevin that stood out was how long he prayed over his food. I don't know how long y'all pray over food. My grandma used to say, when somebody, when somebody used to bless the food for a long time, she would whisper, you know, old people whisper loud. Like, what are you doing? Well, yeah, yeah. And grandma would say, don't they ever pray at home? <laughs> because they would just, you know, when you bless the food, just bless the food. Don't do your whole missionary list on blessing the food. Just bless the food. That's all you got to do. But Kevin was like, unbelievable. We went to McDonald's one day and uh, got my Big Mac and we all got stuff. And Kevin said, brothers, if you don't mind, I'll bless the food. He said, okay. Not exaggerating, y'all. Ten minutes later, we have, we have not eaten our food yet. He is still praying over the Big Mac that long. As he begins his prayer, 
He prays, Lord, thank you for this beautiful day. He starts praying. I'm thinking, well, it's going to be short. So I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm unwrapping my Big Mac, getting it wrapped. And he starts praying, Lord, I pray for the people in the back. Dear God, you would help them in the back as they prepare food. And as they get the hamburger out, may you help them as they prepare the hamburger for our sustenance of food and everything else. And then it's saying, Lord, we know there are people in the drive through right now, in the drive through line. And no doubt some of these people don't know the Lord in the drive through line. I pray you would get their attention right now. Holy Spirit of God, arrest their attention and let them know they need God. I'm thinking, let's eat. He keeps on praying. He says, Lord, I know there are people around us. And I know even as we're praying, they're looking at me as we're praying. I pray the Lord, you will let them know God's real. God's real. And I'm thinking, Lord, Lord let him know to shut up. So I'm praying. Just be quiet. <laughs> and so he's praying. Ten minutes later, he finally says, in the name of Jesus, amen. I'm thinking, wow. I said, Kevin, you will never pray again. That's what I tell you. <laughs> You are done praying for food. You will never pray again. Uh, there's no sense in that. Now, but see, once again, he's a new convert. The new converts, I said the first service, have strange ideas. I mean, new converts think you ought to read the Bible every day. Isn't that crazy? New converts think you ought to pray every day. New converts think you ought to, you know, tell people about Jesus. Is that a crazy mindset? I need to tell someone about the Lord. And so new converts would just go through places and tell people about Jesus and everything. Uh, well, I remember the first, when I got saved. Uh, I got saved on Sunday. I went to church. I mean, I went to school on Monday, of course. And my first period class, I had some hard classes. My first period class, this is so tough. It was home ec. I know. <laughs> I know. And so... There was a girl in there that, man, I really lusted after. Man, I lusted. I'm here to tell you, lust, lust, lust. I won't say her first name because the video, it's, I won't say her last name, I mean. But her name was Melanie. Oh, did I think a lot of Melanie. Seen that cartoon, Pip in the Pew? Where Pip, we just go through the thing dancing. That was me, Charles Le Pew. Yeah, right there. And Melanie would be in class, and I would say, Melanie, Melanie, Melanie. Melanie in every game at the time of day. Melanie, Melanie. But I would say, Melanie, Melanie. And uh, I went to school the next day after getting right with God, and Martin Milton would say, Charles, there's Melanie. And I would say, not today. He said, what do you mean not today? I said, Mark, you may not understand this, but... Uh, I got born again. He said, what? He said, were you in a car wreck? <laughs> I said, no, man. I said, I gave God my heart. He said, great. He didn't know what I was talking about. He gave Mark a care less. He said, but look at Melanie. I said, I can't look at Melanie no more like that. I said, I got to look at Melanie with good eyes. I mean, I can't be lusting. I can't be doing that kind of, I, I got to think pure. Now, on Friday, I would have lusted all day long. Amen. But not on Monday. And I'd be getting right with God. Well, man, I, I remember this like new converts, right? They just think crazy. So we go eat lunch. And you no, know, we had to go eat lunch back then. Now y'all don't eat lunch. Y'all just do what you want to do. But back then, you had to go eat lunch. You couldn't go out. You had to stay in, in school. So I was sitting down. So all the football players sit together and all everything else. So I'm sitting down. And the Lord said, You need to bless your feet, Charles. I said, Are you serious? He said, Yeah, bless the feet. I thought, what are they going to say? Lord, it doesn't matter what they're going to say. You bless the food. I said, mm. I said, I'll do it. So I bowed my head. I said, Lord, in the name of Jesus, bless this food, whatever it's called. Bless it right now. And Lord, help me to know what to say when I raise my head. <laughs> in Jesus' name I pray, amen. And I raised my head. And 50 pairs of eyes were looking at me. And they were saying, well, what were you just doing? And I said, well, it's called blessing the food. And they said, and why were you doing that? I said, well, I'm giving God thanks for the food, but more than that, I'm giving God thanks for saving my soul. And they said, so you asked God to bless your food? I said, yeah. They said, bless mine. Because <laughs> mine's awful. Please do it. <laughs> 
<laughs> do something with it. But those are new converts. I mean, new converts just do stuff because they love God. They don't care. They just want to do this kind of stuff. Well, kind of lose the luster. In 1 Corinthians, let me read this to you. I'm going to, uh, let me go to it. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, as I begin this, I want you to know something. There are three types of people in this church this morning. Uh, really, right. Uh, here we go. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 12. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. Natural. So the first man is a natural man. What is a natural man? A natural man is a man who doesn't know God. Got it? He's called what? Thank you. Then we see in verse uh, 15, but he who is spiritual appraises all things. So there's a natural man who, is, who doesn't know God. Then there is a spiritual man, and that person, of course, knows God. Are you with me so far? But then there's a third type of person. What? And I, brethren, he says, could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as men of flesh, mere infants in Christ. The third type of person is called a carnal Christian or a carnal man. Now, isn't that kind of odd? Maybe you've never heard that phrase before. It's in 1 Corinthians 3, a whole lot. It's in Galatians 5, but it's there. So there's a natural man who, is, who doesn't know God. Then there is a spiritual person who's grown in Christ. Then there is a carnal person, a carnal Christian. Now, they say today... It's what they say, that in the typical church in America, right here, you're sitting in it, that 95% of the people sitting in the pews this morning are carnal. That's what they say. I guess talking about you and me. We're carnal. Carnal being defined as, yes, I know God, but I still want to rule my own life. That's a carnal Christian. I'm, I'm a believer, but I'm in charge. And God says, no, 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 no. Because he says to Matthew 16, 24, if you want to follow me, you must pick up your cross and do what? Deny yourself, follow me. So now, with that in mind, I'm looking at finally the prodigal son. Uh, look at verse 1 through 2 in Luke 15. You know this, in Luke 15, there's a story. There's three parables. There's a story of the woman and, and the lost coin. You know that one. There's a story of the shepherd and the lost sheep. You know that one. And then there's a story of the prodigal son and the older brother and the father. And you know that one very well. The question must be asked right now to this beloved crowd in front of me. Why did Jesus tell this parable? Why did he tell the story about the woman and the lost coin? Why did he tell, tell the story about the shepherd and the lost sheep? Why did he tell the story about the prodigal son? Why was that even told? Well, in Luke 15, verse 1, listen, listen to, to the word. Now, all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near him to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners, and he eats with them. Lo and behold, what is Jesus doing eating with sinners? of all things. Now you do know in the word of God one of his names given to him is friend of sinners. That name friend of sinners was not given to him by his father in heaven. That name was given to him by the Pharisees. Isn't that great? They called Jesus. He's nothing but a friend of sinners. Aren't you glad? Amen. Yeah, I'm, I'm sinner. I'm so glad he's a friend of sinners. And so they could not believe that Jesus, who claimed to be the most holy man ever to live, who claimed to be the Messiah, they could not believe if you're the son of God, why are you eating with sinners? Because, see, they taught this. The Jews taught this. You can help poor people. You can help people who don't have anything to eat. Give them money, but don't be friends with them. Kind of like today, you know, same thing. You know, give them money, but get out of my way. And so they couldn't think, why are you eating with these sinners of all people? You're the God. Here's Jesus who says, I am the Son of God himself. And they couldn't get their mind wrapped around the fact that here's God. And guess what God does? Guess what Jesus does? Us, he goes out and he touches and he touches lepers and he talks to prostitutes 
He hears Jesus, the holy man of God, talking to prostitutes and touching a leper, and they're saying, if you were the son of God, why are you eating with sinners, and why are you around these low earth people? It makes no sense. And so Jesus now is talking to the church people. That's what the Pharisees are. And he tells these parables. And he tells the parable, so many times you forget that people need Jesus. And so many times we forget that. And we do. The person beside you this morning, look at them right now. Just look at them. There they are. Yeah. Yeah. Guess what? They need Jesus. They need Jesus. No. But I'll tell you this. Just tap, just tap on the shoulder. That person you just tap on the shoulder. Think about this. It's going to spend eternity either in heaven or hell forever. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They're going to spend eternity either in heaven or hell. Forever. And so it's amazing how in church we forget that stuff. And so God gives these parables about a woman. Now, I told him Tuesday night, uh, Luke, Dr. Luke, he spoke more about women than any other book in the Bible. I mean, he went out of his way to talk about women, women, women. And if you read the book of Luke, Luke has a lot of stories about women. Why is that such a big deal? Because back when Jesus was alive during that day, women had no rights. And so he went out of his way to say, let me tell you about women. Women are this and this. He gave women a place in life. He gave them things to do, and he gave them ministry in life. And so he wanted the Pharisees to know, I'm going to talk to you about women. Then he talks to them about shepherd. A shepherd, that was like, why are you in that profession? Of all professions, they look down upon that profession. So he talks about shepherds. And then he talks about a rebellious son. Do you know in Leviticus what they were supposed to do with, with a rebellious son? Stone him! So if you became rebellious in the book of Leviticus, they said, I got a rebellious boy. Where's the rock pit? <laughs> We're going to stone him. And he gives three stories about women, about a shepherd, and about a prodigal son, three classes of society that they look down upon. And he says, let me tell you how the father's heart goes out to these people in an incredible way and how we forget about that. So let's look at it. Luke 15, verse 25. Let's look at the elder son. Now his older son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. Whoa. Any good dancers in the house? You'll never admit it. They not only heard music, get this, they heard dancing. That's some dancing going on. Amen. When you can hear the dancing, I mean, we're really dancing. And he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry. Whoa. And was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. He wouldn't go in. Now, this is just the passing. One of the things about carnal Christians, 1 Corinthians says, they're jealous. They have short tempers. They have that stuff in their life. Now, I know you're not sitting around nobody this morning like that. That's in the first service. Uh, people with short tempers, people who get jealous. You don't include me. You didn't call me up. Um, they love to pout. You know anybody who pouts? Growing up when I didn't get in my way, I'd pout. Have you ever pouted? Sure you have. My mom would say, Hey, Charles, if you want to pout, go to your room. I thought, huh, take my ball and go home. So I'd go to my room to pout. You know what I would do? I'd quit pouting. You know why? Nobody could see me pout. 
It's no fun to pout in private. Nobody can see you. I'm a public powder. I want people to see I'm pouting. Look at me. I'm sad. I'm depressed. I'm pouting. You didn't include me. You didn't call me. You didn't let me be involved in the conversation or the party or the lunch or this. And you didn't call me up. The prodigal son says, what's going on, man? Oh, haven't you heard? Your younger brother, he came back home and he became mad. What? You mean he's been after these whores, wasting money, and dad came and gave him a calf? He came home? Yeah, isn't that great news? No, it's not great news. How could dad do this? Is that how, is that how the story goes? Yeah, look at it. 27, he said to him, your brother has come and your father killed the fattened calf because he received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in and his father came out and begged, pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, look, for so many years I've been serving you and never neglected a command of yours. Now that's a lie. Hey Amen. that's a lie. And yet you've given me, you never, and you never give me a young girl that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, whoa, this is not the dad's son, it's his brother. But when this son of yours came, who devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fat and calf for him. And he said to him, son, you've always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live. He was lost and he has been found. So let's look at the elder brother. And like I said, theologians say that 95% of the people in the church today is the elder brother. Now if that's true. We all in trouble. Well, that means most of us today are the older brother. Think that's true, Charles? Let's find out. The older brother has some good virtues. He was a hard worker. He wasn't lazy. Uh, he was community-minded. I guarantee he was community-minded. I bet he paid his bills on time. I bet he helped people out. I bet he was part of the Civitans Club, the Kiwans Club, the Lions Club, all those clubs. He was part of it all. And when he walked through the town... I bet people whisper to one another, hey, that's the boy. That's the boy that stayed home with his dad and mom. Hey, that's the boy. That's the boy that's a hard worker and he's responsible. There's the boy who, who loved his parents and he never broke his dad's heart. That's the boy. He is the pride of the community. And he compared favorably to the younger brother. And think about it. Who would you want for a son? Would you want one boy who will take half your money, not be responsible, can't hold a job down, who's a party animal, he's going to leave home, he's going to disgrace the family, or would you want a boy who's a hard worker, who's responsible, who goes to church every Sunday, saves his money, loyal to his family? It's obvious. I want the other boy, I want the one that's responsible. That may sound good, and listen, I'm telling you the truth, but he breaks the biggest two commandments in the Bible. What do you mean, Mose? Here it is. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. He didn't love his father the way he should, and he didn't love his brother. Yet, he was at the father's house every day. Every day. There are people today in this room. You're in the Father's house all the time. But they would say that 95% of us are this, this, this guy right here. Well, what do you think? Point one, I got like nine points. I'll do two. Thank God. We'll be all right. Number one, church people can be the meanest people in the world. Would you say amen to that? They can be. I mean, they can be hateful. How in 
in the world can church people be so mean? We're supposed to have Jesus in our hearts, right? But if we see someone we don't like, we put on Facebook something bad about them. Watch that person, or we don't meet them somewhere. And we're church people. We're people who go to church, and yet we treat them so. I mean, if I ever fall in sin, I pray I don't fall into the hands of church people. <laughs> pray to God I don't. I'd rather fall into the hands of a bunch of drunks. Take me to Lucky's. <laughs> Just take me to Lucky's. Let me sit down there at Lucky's. Let me sit at the bar. And I'm not going to drink any beer. I'm not going to do that. But my beer days are over. But I followed into sin. Because if I fall into sin, or if you fall into sin around some church people, they'll, they'll, they'll just about crucify you. They'll about kill you. And what are we supposed to do? We are to love people. We would say, you knew better than that. You shouldn't have done that. Charles, why did you do that? And we'll just stomp them and kick them and stomp them and kick them. And the Bible says in Galatians 5 that we insist that we are to restore when gently watching ourselves because we too could fall also. But see, the elder brother says, look at you. Look at what you're doing. I can't believe you're doing that. I'm telling you, man, church people are some of the meanest people in the world. 